for us. Yeah. Yeah. Can we start now? Yes, if you want. Did you, are the students able to hear this? Did you check? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, and you see my screen? Okay, I will. Ana Paula, would you, yes. like, would you like to say some words for the students today? Before uh, our hello everyone you are all welcome to our uh, meeting this morning and we hope that uh, you are able to get all the information that dr jaluk will give us please take note of all the informations and take notes of your questions that you could have for dr jaluk don't be afraid to to write, you can write in Portuguese and we translate to her. And please um, enjoy because she's an ex expertise in what she, she will present to us. Welcome everyone. And thank you very, very much Dr. Jaluk for accepting our invitation for this course. It's a great pleasure for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Obrigada. <laughs> Thank you, Ana Paula. I will ask André, that is a postdoc from, from Cellular Microbiology Laboratory, to introduce Dr. Geluc. Thank you, Geluc. Thanks, Roberta. Thanks, uh, Ana Paula. So, as Roberta and Ana Paula said this morning, we will watch the presentation of Dr. Anemie Geluk. So, Dr. Geluk, it's a pleasure for me to make your introduction and thank you for your virtual presence here with us. So, uh, Dr. Anemie Geluk is professor of immunodiagnosis of bacterial infectious disease, leprosy, and tuberculosis at Leiden University in the Netherlands. During her PhD, Dr. Geluk specialized as an immunologist, <coughs> immunologist at the Department of Immunohematology and Blood Bank at the Leiden University, uh, as well as Cyto Corporation San Diego, United States. She received postdoctoral training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and currently, her research focuses on immunodiagnosis of leprosy and TB, including basic, translational, applied, as well as field research, and also on TB vaccine development. And, uh, and uh, today, she will speak for us about tools and tests to pursue and predict mycobacterial disease. Thank you, Dr. Gelug. Obrigada, André. So, <laughs> bom dia a todos. And the rest will be in English. And uh, so, uh, indeed, my name is Annemie Gluck, and uh, I'm a long-time collaborator of uh, several researchers at uh, Pio Cruz. So, it feels very good to be back in Brazil, at least virtually uh, today, then. So, um, I work at the Department of Infectious Diseases in, at the Leiden University Medical uh, Center in the Netherlands. And my group works mainly on immunology and on uh, immunodiagnostics of mycobacteria. So I will close my uh, video now so that you can't see here anymore. So, so the Department of uh, the Infectious Diseases at the LMC works on two mycobacterial diseases, so leprosy and TB. And we work on, on fundamental research, translational research, preclinical, clinical, and finally also into public health on several uh, topics. And these include like diagnostics on uh, HDT, uh, vaccines, and also basic research. Well, in this lecture, I would like to address some overlapping topics 
which are the identification of host biomarkers, and in the second part, test developments and applications of diagnostic tests. But first, about leprosy. Uh, I hear some, somebody else, so perhaps you can mute your mic, please. Thank you. So first, leprosy. Uh, leprosy is an infectious disease, as you all know, caused by mycobacterium leprae. It is associated with poverty, affects the skin and peripheral nerves, and thereby causes irreversible long, lifelong handicaps. However, it can be treated very well with MDT, so multidrug therapy, combination of antibiotics, and also it's not very contagious. Even in endemic countries, it's not very contagious. So what then? Is leprosy important enough to invest in and to do research on? Because for researchers in infectious diseases, there are much more severe pathogenic threats imposed on us by other human beings, by other animals, by even by food. And the obvious example, of course, now is COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2. So since March this year, it seems that COVID-19 is the only disease that everybody is interested in, like researchers, funders of research, politicians, and laymen in the community. And this has also influenced research on mycobacterial diseases. As I'm sure you will hear more later on this course uh, uh, on COVID-19, but currently, COVID-19 has killed about 1.2 million people and infected many more. And another example of an emerging infection, which you've probably also heard about, is Ebola. For instance, the outbreak in 2014 in uh, uh, the West African part of Africa uh, killed about 6,000 individuals. So, but what about TB? How many lethal cases does that disease cause? Well, in fact, TB has killed uh, the most individuals and many more than any other infectious disease in the past 200 years. So more than malaria, more than AIDS, and also now still more than COVID. However, uh, what you see for uh, TB, is that if you look here on the right, and the people dying of TB, for instance, in India is 1,200, whereas people dying in the same area from COVID is 440. But still, TB does not get the same attention as COVID-19. And another example, for instance, in Bangladesh, a country where also a lot of leprosy is occurring, People dying of TB, 129 per day, whereas only 25 for COVID. And something else that you have to keep in mind, and this is not a politically incorrect statement, leprosy first. It is, leprosy was the first disease for which many milestones in research were identified. So for instance, the in identification of a mycobacterium as a pathogen for human disease, the HLA disease association, and the TH1, TH2 dualism in human cells, and also the identification of T-Rex or regulatory T cells. So this is not only important for TB, which is caused by a similar mycobacterium, but it's also for autoimmune diseases and now even for COVID, since, for instance, cytokine storms that occur in COVID-19, they bear resemblance also to the so-called leprosy reactions. So being a model disease for other immune or infectious diseases is a good reason to study leprosy. However, another reason to study leprosy is based on the challenges that leprosy is still facing, namely the quite static number of new cases, so 200,000 worldwide annually, and this includes 10% of children. Furthermore, also when they're not treated as leprosy patients anymore, people still experience 
all the disabilities and handicaps due to leprosy. And there are about three to four million people who have those handicaps. So transmission is ongoing of mycobacterium leprae, but the, the problem is there are no good diagnostic tests available that can identify infection. So those that are infected but have no, uh, no clinical, no visible uh, uh, complaints and uh, a diagnostic test for early diagnosis of leprosy so we can early treat and prevent disabilities due to leprosy. So these are the challenges facing leprosy. And that is the second reason why we also still put uh, efforts into uh, research in leprosy. Well, for you being part of Brazil, uh, it's also important to focus on leprosy because Brazil is the second country in numbers uh, for leprosy. The first being India and second Brazil with 13% of the leprosy incidents worldwide and the third Indonesia. So what about leprosy diagnosis? You probably know that leprosy diagnosis is still mainly clinical. Yeah, so it's based on cardinal signs like skin patches, loss of sensation, and thickened nerves. And in addition, microscopy provides information on the presence of acide falls, bacilli. So individuals that run risk to develop leprosy uh, can be identified as follows. So who runs the greatest risk are those that live very close to untreated leprosy patients. So household contacts or neighbors or people that have social interaction with a, a leprosy person. Furthermore, also people that interact contact with multi uh, uh, with, with multibacillary patients or PB patients with two to five lesions have more risk of developing leprosy. And finally, those that are blood related, so genetically related, they also have more chance of developing leprosy. A problem in leprosy research and or clinical research of leprosy is that uh, the incubation time is very long or can be very long. So typically it's two to five years, but it can be even 10 to 20 years. And this was reflected in the slide that you see now in this publication, a chimpanzee was captured in the wild in uh, Africa and brought to a zoo in Asia and Japan and developed leprosy in the zoo. And they determined while, by sequencing the mycobacterium, they determined that it was derived from mycobacterium leprae occurring in Africa. So it had to be infected while it was still in the wild, which was over 20 years ago. So this indicates that incubation time plays uh, plays part in, in leprosy. And in fact, in the Netherlands, where my group is the National Routine Diagnostic Center for Leprosy, uh, what we see is also that we have cases from individuals who uh, have not been born in the Netherlands, but they were, were uh, they, they came, came here very a long time ago and still develop leprosy after like 10 to 20 or even 30 years. So therefore, what do we want to do is we want to identify those individuals in whom mycobacterium leprae survives and who are incubating leprosy because those are the ones that can transmit the bacteria in addition to multibacillary patients. So we want to identify or develop diagnostic tests for those individuals so that we can identify them and then provide treatment either for leprosy MDT or post-exposure prophylactic treatment for those that are infected but not have the disease. So we will do this, so we are doing this at the LUMC through immunology and developing immunodiagnostic tests. So why immunodiagnostic tests? Well, after pathogens invade the host, a lot of cells are becoming activated and they are producing all kinds of uh, molecules like cytokines and chemokines. And these are the biomarkers of immunity and they provide a footprint of infection, either current or previous, and of disease, even when the pathogen is not or no longer present. 
So therefore, this footprint is important because it can tell us something about the disease state and previous infections of an individual. However, for leprosy, it's not that easy because it's not that one test fits all. Because we have, on one hand, individuals with post-bacillary disease, they have cellular immunity and they have protective immunity against uh, the bacterium, provide a lot of Th1 cytokines and do not have any antibodies because they also do not have a lot of bacteria. On the other hand, on the right hand so on this slide, there is the humoral immunity, which is present in the promethous leprosy patient or multibacillary patient. And uh, they have a lot of bacteria. They are not able to kill the bacteria, but they produce a lot of antibodies against mycobacterium leprae, but they have a different cytokine pattern. So they have different footprints, so different biomarker uh, patterns. And you can see that in the middle, those individuals are, are affected. They can either go to the left or to the right part of the spectrum. And to identify them, we need to know by which biomarkers belong to that. So how do we identify those biomarkers? So what we do is we need cohorts. We need good and large cohorts of individuals who we know are not infected, individuals that have the disease, and therefore we need a clinical standard always in these, um, in these uh, um, studies. And then we can identify what biomarkers belong to people with disease and with uh, without the disease. So what we know is that humoral immunity uh, provides us a footprint for multibacillary disease, at least for, for the detection of uh, detection of antibodies, provides us an indication of how many bacteria there are, because there is a relationship between the number of bacteria and the number of antibodies against mycobacterium leprae. And for this, we use antibodies against PGO1. PGO1 stands for phenolic glycolipid 1, and it is part of the cell wall of mycobacterium leprae. In fact, it's 3% of the bacterium, so it occurs a lot. And it's very specific for mycobacterium leprae. There are also pgo ones for MTB or for um, bovis or for BCG, but they're not the same. And they're certainly not as uh, specific for, uh, they're, they're not cross-reactive. So antibodies against mycobacterium leprae are really specific for leprosy. So we know that it detects past and present of, uh, and leprae infection, and there are various tests to identify these antibodies, either the ML flow, which has been there for many, many years. As you can see on the slide, I was tested myself when I was in Rio in, in 2004. I was negative here, I see, but this is the ML flow. But also the ELISA, which you see on the right, or is a laboratory test that uh, is performed regularly to identify antibodies against PGO1. So as I told you, there's a strong correlation between the bacterial load and anti-PGO1 antibodies. So if you want to identify who is infected, this is a good, you know, good approach, good test. However, antibody against PGO1, they do not indicate disease. And also the a positivity of antibodies against PG1 is not predicted for the development of leprosy. So if an individual has antibodies, it doesn't mean the person is also going to develop leprosy. Furthermore, most of the palsy bacillary patients are seronegative. So if we only measure humoral immunity, we cannot identify all leprosy patients. So I have been discussing this with some of uh, uh, Brazilian researchers in this field. So Milton Moraes, as you can see here, who has spent a lot of research into the qPCR testing it. And actually to identify individuals who are infected, 
the qPCR, RLF qPCR, and NSAID1 antibodies, they correlate a lot. So actually, you, there is a big deal of overlap. So and uh, and this indicates that the research circumstances or laboratory uh, um, preferences may decide which way to go, so which test to use. But they both provide similar data. They can identify uh, individuals infected with Mycobacterium leprae. So, so far for the antibody part of the biomarkers. Um, and, and please, I want to emphasize if there are any questions, please let me know. And uh, so it's clear that we have antibodies uh, and that so that is a good biomarker for those that have a lot of bacteria, but we don't have any biomarkers for palsy bacillary disease, for early disease. And also we cannot discriminate really uh, whether uh, there is an active infection or a current infection or a, a previous infection if we find antibody positivity. So therefore, a few years ago, uh, we thought, okay, let's look at TB. In tuberculosis at that uh, time, I think it was about 19 years ago, uh, they identified the RD1 region. And the RD1 is specific for MTB, for pathogenic strains of MTB. It does not occur in BCG, which is a vaccine strain used against mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. And it, it uh, includes two proteins called EZ6 and CFP10. And uh, those proteins were used, or actually peptides of those proteins were used to incubate blood with, and then the interferon gamma response induced by EZ6 and CFP10 was measured. If that was positive, then the uh, test meant that the person was infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. These tests are called the IGRAS, and IGRAS stands for interferon gamma release assay. And one of the commercial versions of it is a quantiferon TB. So we tested this in the Netherlands, so that's a TB non-endemic setting. And as you can see, that people that were TB patients, they reacted, they produced interferon gamma against EZ6 and against CFB10, and uh, BCG vaccinated individuals did not. So it was very specific for MTB infection. So we thought because EZ6 and CFP10 also have homologues in mycobacterium leprae, we thought, okay, let's use mycobacterium leprae, EZ6 and CFP10 to see whether we can also see whether a leprae infection can be identified this way. So we measure T cell responses to EZ6 homologues. So that is the LEZ. And we measured them in TB patients. But what you saw is that they also reacted. So, so they were also recognized by TB patients. And because a lot of leprosy endemic areas, also TB occurs, this was not a good way to go, we thought, because there's cross reactivity. So you cannot identify whether it is TB disease or whether it's MTB infection or and uh, leprae infection. In addition, in, an, uh, uh, in a, a study in New York, uh, William Le Levi's also identified that latent TB in patients with leprosy uh, could not be detected because they already react to in the quantiferum gold. So that is the leprosy patients responding to the TB EZ, so the T EZ. So, both ways they are cross-reactive. So they, it, we thought it was not a good way for a diagnostic for leprosy. So after the M. leprae genome was sequenced, we took the following approach. So all the genes in the leprae, those that had an unknown function, we selected, because if they had a known function, they usually had a homologue in other mycobacterium or bacterium. So we identified those with unknown functions and a size of larger than 8 kD. And then we looked using a, a, a T epitope program so which, to identify whether they had T cell epitopes. And we chose 17 hypothetical proteins. And we tested those proteins as uh, recombinant proteins in PBMC. So using PBMCs of 
leprosy patients and controls in Brazil, in the Rio area, they wish together with the field groups group. So what we saw was the following in individuals, so endemic controls on the left, these were students, actually students at, at Fia Cruz at this uh, time, and uh, most of them were also PGL1 uh, negative, and uh, we saw that hardly any of those had a response of their T cells against these uh, proteins. However, the contacts here on the right, as a, on the contacts of the leprosy patients, we did see uh, interferon gamma responses against the mycobacterium leprae, the unique mycobacterium leprae protein. So this is an added value because they, these individuals, they were not PG1 positive, but they were positive for, in the IGRA. So at this stage, we thought, okay, we can use this IGRA with an leprae unique proteins to identify individuals who are infected with uh, mycobacterium leprae. But then we went to a highly endemic area and compared the same proteins in the same proliferation assay with PBMCs of either TT patients of healthy contacts and of endemic controls. And we did that in Bangladesh and also in South Korea. South Korea is a country that is not uh, endemic for leprosy anymore. And what you can see here is that not only the TT patients but also the healthy household contacts and the endemic control group, they all produced interferon gamma in response to the MLEPRE unique antigen. So that was not good news because uh, this is not discriminatory. So you cannot, in a highly endemic area, you cannot uh, discriminate between patients and uh, those that have been exposed versus the, just the general population. So we needed biomarkers to discriminate disease and infection versus those that are only exposed in the general population. And for this, we use the so-called omics approach. So host, to identify host biomarkers via either genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, or proteomics. So what I will tell you next, we'll only focus on the proteomics approach. So identifying proteins that can be used as biomarkers. And to identify uh, what kind of signatures or what kind of biomarkers belongs to a good signature, so those that are uninfected versus a poor signature, so those that have disease or are infected, we use the multiplex assay. So this is called the Luminex assay. And this works as follows. This is actually a beat assay and every beat is specific for one cytokine or chemokine or growth factor. And therefore you can measure multiple beats in one sample of 25 or 50 microliters only. So this is of course a laboratory based approach. And uh, uh, so this is how we identified several of the markers. So we went to first to the field to this case, it was in the area in Northwest Bangladesh to take blood and to incubate the blood for 24 hours, either with mycobacterium leprae whole cell somicate or with M. leprae unique proteins. And then we measured in the Netherlands, we measured using multiplex cytokine analysis, we measured all kinds of uh, cytokines and chemokines. And uh, what we saw is that we could really identify markers that uh, were not, ident not present in those that have PGL1, so not identified in those that have uh, uh, MB leprosy versus PB leprosy. So in other words, we had an added value by measuring cellular mediated immune response uh, proteins. So uh, in this case, this is an example of marker A and marker B. Marker A identified in 23% of the patient group and marker B in 46% and an overlap of 7%. So this is what you then see if you identify markers that do not cluster together. So then you can uh, 
have an added value of your biomarker signature. If this is not clear, please interrupt me. So we identified several of these biomarkers by, by the Luminex assay, and we did so not only in Bangladesh, but also in Ethiopia, China, and in Brazil. And we had three groups or three test groups in here. So either the LLBO leprosy, so those that are already identified using pgl one antibodies only in most cases. The other group was TT leprosy and those that are usually pgl one negative. And then the endemic control group who are pgl one negative and should, if you have a good biomarker, also be negative for the cellular markers. So what you can see here is that the BT, TT, the yellow part, so that's the cellular markers, they identify most of the patients in this group. Whereas for the LLBL, which is the upper part, mostly PG1 and sometimes plus some cellular markers are positive. So this indicates that the good added value of using, in addition to the antibodies, also the cellular mediated immune response biomarkers. And because then you can cover more of the biomarker spectrum. What I need to say here is that uh, the markers that we used were derived from an overnight whole blood assay. So similar uh, to the quantiferon TB assay, which is also overnight incubated uh, blood. Uh, but of course, what we also need is to directly be able to take the blood and directly measure any markers next to the patient. So we need biomarkers for point of care. Yeah. So and therefore we did an extra uh, study. So we I did, we worked on the identification of bio of biomarkers also again with the Luminex assay. And as you can maybe be able to see. Here above are the number of biomarkers that we tested. So we tested them either in the Luminex or in the ELISA. And in some cases we tested whole blood that was incubated, like you could, for instance, do uh, in a reference center where you have a laboratory, you can work with those kind of biomarkers. But we also measured them in plasma or serum because that is a proxy for the point of care measurement because then you measure directly without any stimulus. And we found that some of the markers were very good in discriminating PB from MB and PB from uh, controls when they were stimulated overnight. However, uh, for PB, there were only a few biomarkers that could without any stimulus also be used for uh, discriminating PB from alkyl contact and uh, the endemic controls. So this is because the PB uh, patients, they are very, very similar to household contacts that have been infected with mycobacterium leprae and are either, uh, so either getting rid of the bacteria, killing the bacteria, yeah, which also always goes together with infection and, and with infection and inflammation markers. And on the other hand, there uh, are individuals uh, that are subclinically uh, developing PB leprosy. And this is they, these individuals are very, very similar in their uh, immune responses. And this is also what you see in here. So if we look at the red bars and the blue bars, the red stands for multi-bacillary patients and blue for post-bacillary patients. Uh, the area under the curve is given on the y-axis and the area under, under the curve is a measure for the discrimination between disease and control. And uh, so the higher, the better, um, the better uh, discrimination between the uh, disease and control group. And if you have a whole blood assay, so that means stimulated whole blood, then many markers can be used to discriminate disease from controls for both MB and PB, although there are slight differences in that. 
However, in plasma samples or serum samples only, so without any stimulation, you see that for the blue bars, there's only one actually, so the APOA1, which has a good high area under the curve, meaning that uh, the number of biomarkers is very low that you can measure directly point of care. And this is again summarized. So if you then use all the biomarkers together, so not only one, but in this case, we used five. If you use five biomarkers together, you get a phenotypic, well, a phenotype specific biomarker pattern signature. So uh, to summarize, so we, we had like APOA1, CRP, IL-1 receptor antagonist, S100, A12, of course, anti-IPG1 IDM antibodies, IP10 and, C IP10 and CCL4. And if you then look at the spectrum, we've indicated in the upper figure which are specific for, so which are useful biomarkers for either part of the spectrum. So on the right hand, you see that besides anti-IPG1 IgM antibodies, which you already know, also CRP and IP10 are higher in the patient group than in the control group. Whereas on the left side of the spectrum, depicted in blue, the PBTD part, IL-1 receptor antagonist and CCL4, they can also be used uh, as discriminatory biomarker for PB and TD disease, but only if they are used in the whole blood assay. Yeah, and furthermore, the APOA1 and S100A12, they can be used across the spectrum. And therefore, if you could measure all biomarkers at the same time, uh, you would have not only information of whether the person has disease or not, but can also identify whether disease is post-bacillary disease or whether it's multi-bacillary disease. So using a five biomarker signature has these added advantages, as you can see also below. So for MB disease, already anti pg one IgM has a very high area under the curve. Whereas for PB, uh, APOA1 has a, a, the highest uh, value under the curve, but then you have the added value of the more of the markers. Okay, so I think I've taken about 45 minutes so far. And uh, the next part, of course, will be how do we develop uh, these, these markers into useful biomarkers uh, that we can use at the point of care application. And uh, uh, at this stage, I think it's good to have a break and to take some questions so that after that, I can go on with the second part. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Uh, please, if, if you have any questions. I have one. Can I, can you hear me? Hi, Anamik, it's Milton. Hi. Good to see you. Nice presentation so far. It's, uh, it's good to have you here. It's uh, really amazing what we can do in COVID times, right? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> we can we can have an international course with people from different parts of the world and uh, well your, your presentation has been um, uh, very careful and uh, explaining step by step um, how the immune immune system works towards uh, you know an um, MLAP infection and how difficult it is to indeed uh, select markers or uh, either PCR and thank you by the way very nice picture from us from the <laughs> anesthesia <yeah. laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, but the point is i mean how how actually the you know the the response and how we tackle to select uh, those markers that could be really useful to discriminate especially patients from uh contacts we yeah. know that very difficult right so yeah. um I have a tough question is actually a part of the things that I've been, you know, trying to understand a little better in the, uh, in the past few years is that, uh, I mean, uh, where do you think is there room for improvement? For example, uh, what I'm saying is that for, uh, we've been, you know, trying to use 
um, in, uh, PGL one in different in, in different presentations, right? I mean, we 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 have lysis, we have rapid tests, lateral flows, we have um, synthetic um, sugar moieties, and and uh, you know na native um, uh, PGL one, and uh, I mean we it's very difficult either detecting IgM or IgG. I mean, is it's, it's that a matter of a, a technical issue that, uh, I mean, it's highly variable and then is there uh, room for improvement or do you think that, you know, I mean, obviously I understand why are you using in the, in the, in the combination, the combo where you also bringing with cytokines and, and other markers, right? Because obviously it's a very good marker for MB patients. So, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's clear why we have to use it. But for, you know, for leprosy per se, let's say, would, would that, is there any, any other issue that we could maybe technically uh, improve in the, in the, in the methods to better uh, address the question of a, uh, early detection. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, because I understand that, and this is my point of view, right? Uh, it's a, uh, I understand that PGL1, I don't know, but uh, well, I, I do see something that could be better, but I don't know, it, I mean, how we could tackle it with, with the, you know, the kind of investments that we have and so on. But, uh, but PCR and the immunodiagnostics, I guess that we could, have it uh, very, I mean, we could improve a lot yet. Either. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I think it is, and it, the, the, the diagnostic that you want to develop also uh, depends a lot on the question you have. So what kind, uh, okay. what kind of, what kind of questions you have that you want to answer with your test. So you, you mentioned early diagnosis, for instance. So that is then if we are interested in identifying those individuals that we can directly then treat with MDT. Yeah? So, so to, to compare, to, to, because you know also that uh, um, it, it, the other approach that is now ongoing is SDR or providing SDR to everybody. Is it then necessary to identify or to diagnose even early leprosy? I think yes, because otherwise you under a di you under treat the individual. So, so let's let's say early diagnosis. If your test is uh, that, I think what is important to do there is to identify uh, to do larger cohorts at two with two time points. Really, also what you have been doing with your contacts to see, to follow them up in time. I think follow-up yeah, will just provide us more information. And we, we have uh, the, yeah, we uh, are not so lucky with leprosy because of the long incubation time, because they're doing the same now for COVID, which goes much faster. Right. So COVID infection, you can identify uh, by nasal swab whether an individual is COVID infection. And now what we're doing, we follow them up in time, see who gets the disease and then, you know, follow. But for, I think this is the way to go because this is what we are finding is we, we, we are identifying all kind of uh, biomarkers that are also present in other individuals or for other diseases. And, uh, but this is not the context in which we usually use the tests. So I think the beauty would be if you could identify both the bacterium and uh, um, antibodies and some, some markers. However, I think the moment you identify the bacteria, you usually also, in most cases, identify antibodies. So you don't need to identify any other cytokines. It is the problem with the PB and it is the problem with predicting who is going to develop, develop leprosy. And, but I think that the most important problem in leprosy is uh, transmission still, it is still transmission. And uh, uh, so we need to, to find ways in, to, to use a diagnostic test for um, screening whether any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, implementation 
uh, has been successful or not to, to see whether that is the case. I think that is, that is what we need to have uh, a screening test for, to easily screen whether, okay, what is the difference between in the population between what we measure before and after some kind of implementation. I think this is uh, important. And on the other hand, diagnostic tests could be useful to also, of course, uh, monitor and to monitor treatment, to monitor uh, reactions, for instance, or whether they are occurring or not. I think this is also uh, an important application of, of the diagnostic test. And I see there room for improvement, but you know, we, we need to do the longitudinal. And uh, uh, I think this is important. And it would be, you know, would be lovely if we could do that in a greater context, of course, doing both with, with uh, um, but with samples in this in different essays, still something that, that that I would love to do. Thank you, thank you very much. Doctor, <laughs> Look, yeah, I have a question from a shy person here in private chat. <laughs> So have you seen markers that behave differently according to the population that has been studied? So uh, you think is the genetic background or environment factors a big issue in response to M. leprae? Mm. It's a good question. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, yes, we did see differences in how well a biomarker behaved. So whether the discriminatory uh, ability was good or not so that good. And also what we've seen is that, for instance, PGL1 uh, also behaved differently. And that is not because, at least I think it's not because uh, then the marker is, diff is, is behaving differently, but because uh, the uh, number of uh, for instance, PB uh, leprosy is much more uh, and uh, much more found, much more frequently found in Bangladesh than in other countries where it's more MB. So I think it depends on how the healthcare program is doing the active case finding. If they do active case finding, what you usually see is a lot of PB and then uh, of course, the PGL1 marker behaves differently. On the other hand, I think that um, um, if we, we are going to look more closely or to more uh, uh, different markers, I think that also in, in uh, for instance, in a study that we did recently in, uh, in Korea, we saw that, that the PB were more polar and the MB were more polar and the markers in between that, that uh, also did not discriminate a lot. So there was a lot of overlap. So yes, there are some markers that, that work not as good in, in uh, different areas, but I'm not sure whether it's genetics or whether it's high or low endemicity and the way the healthcare program looks for new cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Some questions? There are two questions in the chat, Andrea. Yeah. Yes. Let's see. Para Rosalind Hermitado. Okay. Uh, did the biomarkers that presented this uh, regulated different form of leprosy when passing PBMC have greater specificity together? Couldn't they be passing on a IGRA model for leprosy? No. Uh, are there some studies about this? Yeah, so, so we, we actually study that a lot. So IGRAS for leprosy, so for either using EZ6 or CFP10. And, uh, but they were cross-reactive in the sense that uh, they are also positive in TB patients. And that is not what you want when you have to identify it, uh, to develop a diagnostic tool that needs to be specific for a disease. 
Is that answering the question? Uh, let's see, Sara. Okay. I think it, you answered the question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay thank you. So another question is, uh, Dr. Ligaluk mentions that the combination of biomarkers can improve leprosy disease, but this behavior is the same as people infected with mycobacterial le leprosy and mycobacterial lepromatosis. Mm. That's a nice question, yeah. Uh, I don't know. We have not tested individuals who were infected with mycobacterium lepromatosis. However, I do know that these individuals are also, uh, if they are you know, multibacillary, they are also positive for pg one because pg one antibodies cross-react with mycobacterium lepromatosis. And we know that from the, the data that we have in the squirrels. And uh, so, and since mycobacterium lepromatosis is usually a very, very aggressive form of leprosy and also induces a lot of uh, cytokines uh, uh, that are inflammatory, I suppose that also IP10 would be rather high in CRP. Okay, thank you. So, uh... Uh, we'll we'll take a ten minutes break and we'll back we'll be back at eleven eleven five a.m. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Very nice presentation. <laughs> we'll Thank see you. you soon. <laughs> Just a break, okay? And after 10 minutes, okay, Ernie, okay. You come back.
Shall I start again? Can you see if everybody's there? Yes, yes. We can start now. Okay, good. Okay, good. So this just has been a, a summary of identification of biomarkers in the first part uh, of it. And um, as we discussed, and in the break, I thought of this picture and I inserted this because I do think that we can develop better diagnostic tests for leprosy that are still useful. Only we have to think about okay, what is necessary and for whom or for which purpose. Anyway, important to keep in mind then, of course, is also what we said in the questionnaire uh, is that together we can find ways. So we need multiple cohorts and longitudinal trials. That is important. So as I just told you, uh, measuring anti-PGL1 in addition to cellular markers gives added value. And so either as single markers or in a biomarker signature. But having identified such markers is one thing, but applying them also in the field is something else because in the field you're not, you can't use any ELISAs or other laboratory associated equipment and you don't get any Luminex, but of course, we do want to measure multiple biomarkers. So in addition, also, uh, let, also tests that uh, are measured to point of care, they need to be according to the assured uh, in indication. So affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, robust, equipment-free, preferably, and deliverable. So therefore, we need to translate our laboratory work to the field. And how have we done it? Well, since 2007, I've been working together with Paul Korschens in, uh, uh, in our lab. And uh, he has a system called UCP lateral flow. So UCP stands for upconverting reporter particles. It is a highly technical uh, instrument, but it can be used at low complexity. It is a field-friendly alternative for an ELISA, and I will show you in a minute how it uh, works exactly. Important is that it is a quantitative assay, so there is a correlation of the signal that is measured in the UCP lateral flow and uh, the amount of biomarker in a sample. It's also highly sensitive because it has no background, because the particles that are used do not occur in the environment, so therefore it has no background. And also it's stable, so it can be transmitted without a cold chain. Finally, it doesn't bleach, so it gives you a permanent record. And this is how it works. Uh, the particles that are part of the test and actually used as a test label, so the UCP particles, they are excited by infrared light. And when they are, there is an energy transfer, and then there's this is followed by emission of light in the visible spectrum. So therefore, it's called up conversion. Well, this process can be repeated time and time and time again. So if you have strips, lateral flow strips, which have run a sample, as seen on the right here, then you can perform the analysis time and time again, and each time. Again, the energy is transferred from uh, low to high uh, and emits indivisible spectrum. So we published uh, on this on several uh, occasions using either whole blood assays or finger prick assays or uh, 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 pulmonary, uh, uh, pulmonary samples from TB patients. And uh, this is how it works. So this is the lateral flow strip, this stripe underneath, and the particles that are used, the UCP particles, they are conjugated to an antibody uh, that is against human IgM, yeah? So UCP anti-human IgM is the labeled part. And in a sample, if it encounters human anti-PG1 IgM antibodies, this, this will bind. And then if the bound complex then flows over the strip, it encounters 
PGL1, either synthetic or a naturally occurring PGL1. And then it binds again to the PGL1. So the human enzyme PGL1 IgM binds to the PGL1 on the strip. So this is the test part of the strip. Particles that have not bound, they will encounter the flow control if they flow further. And then there will also be here, there will be the control part of the strip. So in a positive sample, there are two peaks, one corresponding to the test, the other to the flow control, which has both, they have antibodies on the strip and one has the uh, anti-human PGO1 IDM with the label UCP and the other does not, but has also the labeled UCP. If a, uh, a sample is negative, then this peak is not occurring, but this peak of course should occur so that you know that your sample has flowed correctly. Now, this is again a, a schematic way of the UCP lateral flow. So it flows, blood flows from the sample pads to the absorbent pads, this direction. It encounters first the test line and then the control line. What we use as a readout is the ratio, the R value. And this is the amount of luminescence on the test versus on the flow control. So it's test divided by flow control. And this ratio is the number that we, we use so the quantitation of the amount of particle, the amount of biomarker present in a sample. So in the field, uh, it goes as follows. If we use a finger prick method, then uh, a patient or control uh, is uh, we use a finger prick in the finger, and we take an exact amount of 20 microliter using a mini vet. And so um, this is important because uh, otherwise you won't have the quantitation. So you need to take the exactly the same amount of each individual. So we either add these 20 mic microliter of capillary blood to a mini to a, a buffer to lyse the blood, or we add it directly on the cassette and uh, uh, then chase it with a flow buffer. In any uh, case, uh, it is read by a portable reader and uh, which has a, uh, a which has a, um, a cassette, which has a, a part of this uh, specific for the cassette. And then uh, the results are quantified using the method I just explained with the ratio. So dividing the test versus the flow control. The UCP can be used together with uh, whole blood or capillary blood because the uh, hemoglobin does not interfere with the UCP signal. And this is important, of course, if you want to measure point of care so that you don't have, have to use serum, but you can directly use uh, capillary or whole blood. Now, of course, the second question then is, so we can measure uh, with the UCP lateral flow, we can measure one marker at a time, like we are doing for PGL1 antibodies, but can we also measure multiple biomarkers? Because in the first part of my presentation, I showed you that especially for those individuals whom it's hard to identify whether they have a leprosy infection, so the PB, uh, patients and the leprae infected uh, contacts. That for those individuals, uh, we need multiple markers to identify a biomarker signature and to also then, of course, we want to, to measure that in the field. So we need to have a point of care diagnostic test for multiple biomarkers, measure them simultaneously, but keep the quantitative aspect of the FSA. And this is what we have identified or developed recently. And uh, so it's called the MBT, stands for Multiple Biomarker Test, very simple. And it's also, again, a UCP lateral flow test. However, it is not a small strip that we use now, but we use a broader strip. And on the strip, uh, we have six markers. And each marker has a test line and a flow control line. In contrast to single marker, where we have the reader directly reading 
same, the same way as the flow is, is going, so that is vertically, uh, what we do here, we have the, all the, the markers re uh, read in the reader horizontally, so 90 degrees to the sample flow direction. And this means that uh, you can then have no interference of the different markers with each other. So you can measure them simultaneously, but the signal they give will not be, they will not receive any interference of the signals of the other markers. And that is new for this type of uh, multi-biomarker test. So actually it's quite different from the, the, the setup for the single markers. Of course, you need also a larger amount of volume, of blood volume, but still you can use like 50 microliters of finger prick, add it to a buffer and then uh, flow it in a device like is indicated on the right below, yeah? So for the uh, reading, uh, actually, as I said, so this is the sample flow and here uh, horizontally, the reader will uh, provide its uh, infrared light and read it in, in the horizontal direction. So it will encounter first the test line and then the flow control line of the first marker, then the test line and flow control line of the second marker, etc. So we will have a, uh, a, a, peak, um, a peak display of each of these uh, 12, actually 12 parts of the multi-biomarker test. And this is then what a, a general uh, spectrum would look like. So in this case, uh, there is the first marker and then the flow control of that marker and then the first mark, second marker and flow control of the marker, etc. So you can also see that some of the markers are much higher than the others, but this is the normal pattern uh, then for, for these markers. So we have instead of one ratio value, actually six ratio values. And the reader is also a little bit adapted because of course the, the cassette in which the MBT strip uh, needs to be before it goes into the reader is, uh, is custom made at the LMC because the single strip is much more smaller, of course. Well, having identified biomarkers, you would always uh, want to select the most suitable biomarker. So, in a perfect world or a perfect test, you would have a marker uh, that in a control group uh, would di be displayed at a very different concentration than the marker would be displayed in the disease group. So there would be, per if you, you're talking about a perfect test, there would be no overlap between control and disease as is depicted on the left side in this slide. However, in real life, it doesn't work that way. Usually, and, and some of the markers, as I just also mentioned, they are present not only in people with disease or infection, but also in healthy individuals, only the amount is different. So it's either much more in disease or less in disease. And therefore, we need to, for every marker that we have identified by di different techniques, either by ELISA or Illuminex or other proteomics, um, proteomics techniques, we need to uh, check whether, what is the overlap in the amount of, le the level of uh, biomarker that is displayed for controls versus uh, for disease individuals. And because we have a quantitative test, uh, we can also tweak a little bit uh, the outcome. So we can play around and that depends on how, uh, what, what the question is for which we, which we want to use uh, the test. So do we have, want to have a very sensitive test or do we want to have a very specific test? So in other words, how much false positivity do we allow? And uh, so in this case, what you see now, false positivity is about 5%. And the detection, so the, the sensitivity, 60%. But if you tweak around with the cutoff, which you can do when you have quantitative results, then what you can change is the false positivity rate, which is now lower, and the detection rate, which is now 
Yeah, so it is a matter of what you find more important for the purpose of your test, uh, whether or not you have a higher or a lower cutoff. And this is all possible using the multi-biomarker test. In general, what we do is we use the Yaudens index, which is uh, providing information on the sensitivity and the specificity, and then takes the optimum of both, so the com both combined. And this is usually what we use as a cutoff for a, a biomarker. Anyway, in summary, so for the biomarker selection implementation in multi-biomarker tests, after identification of markers through proteomics, we look at, okay, what concentration does a marker uh, provide in, in disease versus uh, controls? How big is the difference between those groups? Because sometimes you get very significant differences, but only on levels that are a few picograms. And that, of course, is a biomarker that will never work in the field. And also we have to look at what antibodies are available uh, either provided by uh, by companies or uh, by by, pre by groups that uh, make or produce antibodies themselves. Then we first do uh, uh, an ELISA for each single marker and uh, also again look at what kind of concentration can be measured and is that enough difference between the control and the test group. And then we make them as a single UCP letter flow and we then look at the ratios. Are these large enough and do, does the difference between the two test groups still provide enough uh, discriminatory uh, level? And finally, uh, how do the differences in the uh, MBT uh, work? And uh, can we al also obtain similar ratios as we did in the UCP letter flow? And finally, of course, what we need to do then is go to different endemic areas where we uh, need to see uh, whether the biomarkers behave similarly and uh, uh, good enough uh, in, in other areas with other uh, genetically and um, endemicity levels. So some point of care applications of our UCP letter flow for leprosy are, of course, to early diagnose, but also to classify, because there's a lot of difference between MB and PB. So not only the PGL1, but also other markers showed the differences. Anyway, so detection, as I already said, of uh, M. leprae and M. leprotosis, but also monitoring treatments. And, and monitoring treatment is actually um, much easier because the patient is already identified clinically. So if you follow the patient, you can perfectly monitor all the biomarkers that, that you want. And this is actually what we do with the small number of leprosy patients that we have in the Netherlands. And then also what I just mentioned in my reply to the question of Milton is that uh, monitoring the effect of post-exposure prophylaxis on and leprae infection. And this can either be done in an individual or it can be done in the community. And finally, also, I think it's very important to uh, monitor uh, development of reactions. And therefore, we really need to do longitudinal analysis. So uh, we have been doing uh, some uh, contact screening already in, in Bangladesh, in China, and uh, a little bit also in uh, Brazil and Nepal, using the finger stick uh, uh, approach. And what we also saw, saw in, uh, in Bangladesh is that uh, uh, treatment monitoring uh, with only PGL1 already works, works well because the levels will uh, uh, decrease upon treatment. And finally, what I also wanted to mention is that, uh, uh, as you may be aware of, uh, not human beings, but red squirrels were infected with mycobacterium leprae and lepromatosis in uh, uh, Scotland and uh, the British Isles. And what we uh, did together with the group of uh, Anna Meredith and Anna Schilling is uh, we measured uh, in blood drops from a, uh, a prick in the, uh, uh, the red scrolls. We measured also uh, anti pg one antibodies using our UCP lateral flow. And uh, what we saw is that uh, there was a good correlation with the clinical signs, although there uh, was 
uh, in the PCR positive, but also some sometimes that individuals uh, that, 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 that the red squirrels were not PDL1 positive. So actually, there, there was a bit of difference between those those two tests. And uh, but the advantage of the PGL1 in this case was that the red squirrels are a protected species, so they cannot be killed or, or hurt in any uh, major way to obtain samples. And usually the PCR was taken from, uh, from lesions. And, uh, uh, and, and for some times uh, that was not always, uh, uh, always possible for these uh, red squirrels. So therefore taking anti-PG1 use bilateral flow is more straightforward for these animals. And in addition, what we also saw is that the clinical signs, if they, uh, developed in time, that they increased in time, that also the PGO1 ratio went up. And uh, so we cannot only measure PGO1 UCP letter flow in humans, but also in uh, red squirrels. Anyway, this will not be a major application because uh, we focus mainly on humans and besides leprosy also, uh, for TB, obviously not measuring anti-RPG01 antibodies because they are very leprosy specific, uh, but using other uh, other markers and uh, other combination of uh, biomarkers. So uh, uh, Milton's question also brought to mind that I could show you just a little bit more of what is currently being uh, uh, used uh, in the field. Uh, as a UCP lateral flow assay for a real um, uh, evaluation. And this is um, one example. Uh, so what we're doing in a, a RI study in Bangladesh is identify the direct effect of SDR on a leprae infection, because we know that a single dose of rifampin is used as a post-exposure prophylaxis way to treat contacts of newly diagnosed leprosy patients, but we actually do not know yet what the effect is immunologically. So that is what we try to measure here with UCP lateral flow for uh, anti-PG1 and also five other biomarkers. So when a patient is diagnosed, and provided with MDT, we do a follow-up, not only in the patient, but also in the contacts who receive SDR or a double dose of SDR. And we follow them at T0, two weeks, four weeks, and six months. So this is now a longitudinal study that is ongoing. And in addition to that, we are working together with the Antwerp group of ITM in the people studying the Comoros and Madagascar. And there uh, we explore uh, whether when we give SDR to uh, individuals that have tested positive for PGL1, whether that provides a better protection than only providing SDR to direct contact. So this is also ongoing and it's a four year follow up study. So we hope to have in two years the, the results on that. So this is all an application of the anti pgl one or the UCP lateral flow study. So you see they're, they're very different. And finally, one other study example of an ongoing study currently is the assessment of leprosy uh, and leprae transmission in a population. As I mentioned before, a leprae infection can be assessed by antibodies, but uh, we don't know if we only measured uh, this biomarker, we don't know whether there was a current or a, a recent or a infection or an infection in the past. So if you measure, of course, a leprae infection in young children by measuring anti pd one antibodies, then uh, if these children are four or five years old, you know, the infection, the transmission can only be, have happened four or five years ago. So you have a time limit on that. So monitoring children in area, uh, and this is what is currently done in Bihar in India, in a door-to-door -door screening survey, children between five and 10 years old uh, uh, are then measured uh, for a leprae infection through anti uh, pg one antibodies and 
uh, what we will do is in a few years we will go back and see whether not in the same children but in the same group of children age group whether uh, the amount of seroprevalence has decreased in the population and this gives an, a, a measure of transmission in an area and of course when we are working and approaching elimination uh, means to identify whether elimination has really occurred or whether transmission is still ongoing are important. So finally, of course, we have been doing this all because of grants of, for instance, LRI, Novartis, and, but also of the uh, Heisler Foundation, the Malta Lab Foundation, the Turing Foundation, and EDCDP. And uh, I wish to thank also many of my co-workers, not only uh, uh, in the Netherlands at the LUMC, who we see here, but also the various field sites which we have worked with together. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Giluk. Excellent presentation, as expected. <laughs> so, we have some questions. Of course. <laughs> so, we have a question from Danusa. Uh, thank you very much, Anemic, for your great lecture. Do you think possible that the POC application to the determine, to determine whether a patient in MDT is uh, at risk of uh, 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 reversal <coughs> or uh, erythema nodosum? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hi, Danosa. Yeah, well, um, I think we can do that. And I think uh, what is important to keep in mind is that uh, the normal values of each individual of some of the markers that we use, they can differ also in people that are healthy. So therefore it's important to compare the levels of each individual with him or herself, you know? So, so that, that you start uh, following the patient as soon as you go on normal MDT and then follow in time. We have seen already, and didn't include in this, um, this presentation, we have seen that certain markers of infection are really going up very high, not only, um, serological uh, markers, but also markers that are uh, uh, gen genetic markers. So using transcriptomics, we've seen that. So yes, I, I definitely think that, uh, that that is possible. Only I think that we need to do more research on that in larger cohorts. Thank you, Jean. Can I, can I have a second round of questions? I would like to let the, <laughs> I'm sorry. <Yes. laughs> no, I, I'd like to just, you know, let the students that do their, uh, their questions first, but uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, you didn't, you didn't mention uh, the, the data on, on, on Renat's uh, uh, thesis on, especially on, on BCG uh, precipitation of the disease and, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I'm always fascinated about the strained immunity that could be triggered by BCG vaccination. And there's a, a lot of people now even trying to, to do COVID protection, especially in the elderly. There, there are a few of, uh, of, of those clinical trials being now and running in Brazil. And uh, I, I just would like you to talk a little bit more Mm -hmm. uh, and how BCG could impact the, you know, the first the immunological profile uh, of, a, of this household uh, transition towards uh, patients. And because uh, and, uh, I know that you measured that and, and how yeah. maybe uh, obviously uh, uh, the trained immunity could, could be yeah. a good explanation for that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that, that's a very nice question. I love to answer that. I would love to talk about that. So BCG is a uh, yeah activator actually of the innate immune system. So uh, as you mentioned, the trained immunity. So by BCG vaccination, 
uh, what we do is we, we create actually a kind of memory of uh, uh, innate immunity. So then when an in innate immunity is not specific, so it can you know, attack all kinds of microorganisms. Uh, so what has been shown for BCG that it protects against yellow fever and, uh, and not only against TB or, or against leprosy. So what I think is going on in uh, individuals who are you know, continuously exposed with mycobacterium leprae and maybe also with other uh, mycobacteria because in the Bangladesh the individuals, they work in the fields a lot and they live sometimes together with a untreated leprosy patients. So they continue, their immune system is continuously challenged. So they are sort of on edge, as you could say. And uh, this, in some cases, uh, it can lead to an overactivation of you know, the immune system. And, and then I think there is a specific trigger because they have been infected with mycobacterium leprae that targets to the skin. Because those individuals, they don't get lung disease. No, they get skin disease. They get leprosy. So there is a difference. And maybe if they had been, you know, kind of in, in I don't know about TB, whether, whether people that are latently infected T, TB could also, you know, be triggered to, to, to get a kind of uh, overactive uh, uh, effect there. But what we saw in, in Bangladesh was individuals, household contacts who were BCG vaccinated, sort of developed an immune pattern with very inflammatory responses and then uh, developed PB disease. Yeah? So what would have happened if we wouldn't have vaccinated those individuals? Would they have self-healed? Because their immune system was already going the right way. It, was, it is kind of protective, only it's just too much. So it will you know, affect the skin, affect the nerves. And then if the damage is done, you know, then the cascade begins. And there's sometimes there's no way back. But so I, I think that also for, for BCG, I mean, I, I, I already, um, this is a, a funny story because uh, two years ago, my son was in a, uh, a BCG vaccination trial with young adults they needed as a control group. And now he says, you know, I have the COVID protection, so I, I can go party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but BCG really, I mean, if I, in, uh, in the MTB life challenge mouse model that I have in, at the LMC, if we infect uh, the, the animals with MTB or we challenge them first, we protect them with BCG, in BCG is already see there's activation of, of the cells. And in the past, I always thought it was, you know, it was, uh, bad for my experience, my experiment, because they were already activated. But now I know BCG immunized mouse, uh, they are already infected, or they are already on edge, they are already activated. So it's logically that they are already responding also a specifically to other control antigens, for instance, that we use in the experiment. And in real life, this will only give you protection unless it will, you know, it's, it's all a balance, of course, and unless it will go too far, yeah. But for BCG, it was only 0.4% of the individuals that had uh, uh, developed real PB disease, but, but still, it's, 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 it's a, a side effect, yeah. Thank you very much, very nice. Thank you, anybody else? Ok. É, sou Roberta. Yes, uh, you look, thank you very much. There are a lot of messages in the chat. Irene, thanks for the presentation. Congratulations. Luana Kelly says that it was a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Deluc. Sara Rosa. Excellent class. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, Dr. Jouluk. Excellent presentation. Great lecture. All students, and thank you very much. It was very interesting, our data. Uh, I'm always 
uh, in doubt about the use of PGL1 as a marker of early disease in, in lepros because in lepros contacts. So because for me, PGL1 is a marker of exposure, not necessarily of infection. And uh, I know that I, I saw that you use the single dose uh, infampsin only for uh, PGL1 positive, or I'm wrong, I don't know exactly. What's your idea? Can you explain more about this? Can, can, can you re repeat it? Yes, the idea that you use the PGL1 for the single doses rifampsin, do you know it's a good idea to select the contacts by the positivity of PGL1? Mm. Yeah, well, the, the idea was uh, to, uh, um, in, in that, that is one arm of that study, yeah. So in the whole study, all contacts receive SDR, and then the uh, neighbors in the surrounding, they are tested for PGL1, and if they are positive, then they also receive single-dose refamping. And the question is then, is that a good idea? And uh, well, I think that uh, we know from other studies that only 25% of the new cases comes from the di direct contact, the household contact, so that known case. The other 75% is from the community. So that was the rationale behind deciding, okay, what if we also treat extra in the, in the community. And then, uh, um, of course, who is going to be uh, responsible for transmission? That is those individuals carrying bacteria. And those individuals that carry bacteria, we know are PGO1 positive. So that's the rationale. So if you would maybe, you know, look at it very simple, you would say, why worry about all these markers for PB? Why just not, you know, eradicate leprosy only by those that can transmit? Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, I have, we have another question here in the, in the chat from Irne Prado. How does the POC application behave with patients with relapsy or re reinfection? That's a good question. And uh, if a person is reinfected, uh, you would uh, see uh, that the, the markers will go up. Actually, we, we have a very difficult patient in the Netherlands who, whose PJ1 antibodies will go, go down, went down, but not completely. And now she is you know, also showing all other markers that are going up again. So I don't think it's reinfection here in the Netherlands, but I do think it's a relapse that she is having that the bacteria were not you know, completely uh, killed. So that is why we, you know, we don't have that many, so we can moni monitor them very detailedly. So she also in her biopsy has bacteria still present. So what I think is that she went down and some of the markers went down, but now, her immune system is not able to, to cope with it anymore. And you know, she's getting more inflammation and, and the bacteria is growing again. So yes, I think relapse, you can, can measure. Reinfection we haven't done, I suppose. We can also do that, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, some questions, anybody else? <laughs> Okay. So thank you again, Dulu. You're welcome. <laughs> and we wait for everybody today at 2 p.m. for Flavio Lab. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Excellent presentation. Bye bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Luc. Thank you. Bye-bye, Danusa. Bye-bye.